Today is Sunday, August the 9th, 2020, and my name is Ron Wise, your worship, lay worship leader for today. On behalf of uh, Reverend Dr. Jim Klebine and myself, I welcome you to this time of corporate worship here at Central United Church. We meet together in our Savior's name, anticipating his presence among us. Whether you call uh, Central United your church home, or maybe for the first time you're tuning in uh, to the live stream or recorded service, we're delighted that uh, we can all join our hearts together in worship. The announcements have been emailed out to uh, those of you on our distribution list. They can also be found on the first page of our website. Uh, this week's uh, weekly news includes about a half a dozen or so notes, so I encourage you to look there for the details. Uh, in his opening comments on the weekly news, uh, Pastor Jim mentioned the blessing, which has been going on for a number of months online. Uh, I have personally found that to be a huge blessing, just listening to different countries and places putting that out there. I encourage you to go online and find some of that. And also, our Thursday evening prayer meetings continue. They're online, so find those details and please join us on Thursday evenings for our online prayer meetings. Two more items for announcements. First of all, uh, during these summer weeks, uh, kids can join in the Children in the Sun online program that uh, Central is offering. It's from Right Now Media, but it's being offered through us here check the website for details and how to join in those activities. So if you've got kids, grandkids, neighborhood kids, you can pass the word along for that. And lastly, looking toward the fall, uh, Monday evenings we've got a new program being offered here at Central Bible Study Fellowship, BSF. Uh, I've been going there for uh, a while. This year we're studying Genesis and this is a men's study. There's a women's study in other places, but Central we're going to be offering a men's study, so uh, if you're a guy, you're more than welcome. Or if you know other guys who might benefit or enjoy that kind of study, uh, stay tuned for more details. We turn our attention now to worship, grateful for our Savior's promise to be in our midst. Week by week as we begin our worship service, we draw our attention to our worship with a call to worship, and often we'll read a text from the Psalms for that. And one of the things and, and reasons we do that is the Psalms instruct us what ought to be our response to God's great love for us. And so in the 105th Psalm, we read, sing to him, Sing praises to his name. Tell of all his wonderful works. Glory in his name. Let the hearts of those who seek the Lord rejoice. We come with all of the things we carry today, but there is, is there not joy as we come to meet our Savior who has given himself for us? Please join me in your hearts in prayer as we pray God's blessing in our worship today. Almighty God, unto whom all hearts be open, all desires known, and from whom no secrets are hid. Cleanse the thoughts of our hearts by the inspiration of your Holy Spirit, that we may perfectly love you and worthily magnify your holy name through Christ our Lord. Amen. We continue in our worship with a song, and Sarah will lead us in that, My Peace. This song is a very simple song that I hope will resonate throughout the week. And we have sang it a while back. And let's 
Let's praise God and remember the great simple message. be blessed throughout the week with God's peace and God's love. Now we come to the point of the service where we pass the peace. And uh, certainly I'm looking forward to the day when we can do that together in this room. Uh, however, on behalf of all of us, uh, I must do it virtually and to the people who are watching. So the peace of Christ be with you. Please join me as we read together Psalm 105. Uh, we're reading the first six verses. That'll be on the first two slides. And then slide three and four are verses 16 to 22. Jim referred to this. And in fact, this psalm also makes mention of the story of Joseph, which we'll be reading uh, later on in our scripture reading. Let's read this together. Oh, give thanks to the Lord Call on his name. Make known his deeds among the peoples. Sing to him. Sing praises to him. Tell of all his wonderful works. Glory in his holy name. Let the hearts of those who seek the Lord rejoice. Seek the Lord in his strength. Seek his presence continually. Remember the wonderful works he has done, his miracles, and the judgments he has uttered. O offspring of his servant Abraham, children of Jacob, his chosen ones. When he summoned famine against the land and broke every staff of bread, he had sent a man ahead of them, Joseph, who was sold as a slave. His feet were hurt with fetters. His neck was put in a collar of iron. 
until what he had said came to pass, the word of the Lord kept testing him. The king sent and released him. The ruler of the peoples set him free. He made him lord of his house and ruler of all his possessions to instruct his officials at his pleasure and to teach his elders wisdom. Praise the Lord. Now we are invited to pray our corporate prayer of confession together and we'll follow this with our own silent personal prayers. Let's pray. Lord Jesus, who sat at the table with outcasts and sinners, we confess that too often our words and actions are not consistent with our beliefs. Often we fail to do the just thing. We have not always loved kindness. Sometimes our pride causes us to stumble from the path of walking humbly with you. Forgive us, we pray. The light shines in the darkness, and the darkness did not overcome it. The true light, which enlightens everyone, was coming into the world. To all who received him, who believed in his name, he gave power to become the children of God. Thanks be to God. Delighted to welcome the boys and girls to our service today, those who are joining us online, and uh, I want to ask you a little a question today. How many games can you think of that we use a ball to play with? What are some of those games? Let's, let's think of them. There's soccer, and there's basketball, and baseball, and volleyball, and golf, and tennis, and even table tennis. Some of us call that ping pong, just to name a few of those games, and no doubt you can think of some more. But you know, for those of us who play those games, one of the things you'll know is really important to keep your eye on the ball. And um, well, a couple of weeks ago, um, I did something I haven't done for a long time. I went with my grandson and his dad, and his father was hitting fly balls, for a baseball, into the field to us, and we were to catch them. Now he, well, this is my grandson who plays baseball all the time, he was very smooth at catching the ball, but I have to tell you, I haven't done that for a long time. And so I had to make very sure I had my eye on the ball so it went into the glove and not somewhere else on my body, you know, those kinds of things. And I was a, a little nervous the few times I was, first few times I was trying to catch one because I hadn't done that for a long time. So you'll know how important it is as you're learning to play those games Keep your eye on the ball. We're reading a, a very interesting story, an amazing story about Jesus today. Um, it's the one where he walks on the water. You see, he'd sent his disciples ahead of him. And th this was after another amazing story. They fed where 5,000 people were fed by Jesus. And uh, he sent his disciples on ahead, and they were rowing the boat across the Sea of Galilee. They didn't have gas motors in those days. And Jesus had gone off to pray. And then uh, they were rowing and a storm came up and they could hardly make any progress. And that's when Jesus came walking on the water to them. And they were at first afraid and he said, don't be afraid. And Peter, in that story, you'll know, he asked Jesus, can I come and walk on the water to you? And Jesus said, come. Peter got out of the boat and he started to walk. But then he looked around and he could see the waves and then see how they feel the wind and see, wondered what in the world am I doing out of the boat? And he began to sink and Jesus reached out his hand and lifted him up. You know, the thing that happened there is that Peter, instead of looking at Jesus, got his eye on all the things that were happening around him. And you know, as Christians, there's an important lesson for us in life. 
um, for us there, that we keep our eye on Jesus, just as we do. You know, we learn those little things in, in baseball and other games about keeping our eye on the ball. Well, that helps us. That's a metaphor for us. It helps us understand about keeping our eye on Jesus as we walk through this life. We're going to pray the prayer our Savior taught us to pray, and so I invite you to now join me in prayer. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. We turn our attention now to what God would say to us in and through the scriptures. Our first reading, Genesis 37, uh, we're starting here the story of Joseph that we referred to uh, in the psalm. Uh, actually, the story of Joseph goes from chapter 37 in Genesis all the way to the end, chapter 50. It's about 25% of Genesis. So there's, there's a lot of detail uh, there. It'd be great to read that on your own or hear someone reading it to you through the audio Bibles on the internet. But today we're just starting in chapter 37 uh, in the beginning of this story, verses 1 to 4 and then 12 through 28. There we go. Jacob, Joseph's father, settled in the land where his father had lived as an alien, the land of Canaan. This is the story of the family of Jacob. Joseph, being 17 years old, was shepherding the flock with his brothers. He was a helper to the sons of Bilhah and Zilpah, his father's wives. And Joseph brought a bad report of them to their father. Now Israel, or Jacob, loved Joseph more than any other of his children, because he was the son of his old age, and he had made him a long robe with sleeves. But when his brothers saw that their father loved him more than all his brothers, they hated him and could not speak peaceably to him. Verse 12. Now Joseph's brother went to pasture their father's flock near Shechem. And Israel said to Joseph, Are not your brothers pasturing the flock at Shechem? Come, I will send you to them. Joseph answered, Here I am. So... Jacob said to him, Go now and see if it is well with your brothers and with the flock, and bring word back to me. So he sent him from the valley of Hebron. Joseph came to Shechem, and a man found him wandering in the fields, and the man asked him, What are you seeking? I'm seeking my brothers, he said. Tell me, please, where are they pasturing the flock? The man said, They've gone far away, for I heard them say, Let us go to Dotham. So Joseph went after his brothers and found them at Dotham. They saw him from a distance, and before he came near to them, they conspired to kill him. They said to one another, Here comes this dreamer. Come now, let us kill him and throw him into one of the pits. Then we shall say that a wild animal has devoured him, and we will see what comes of his dreams. But when Reuben, the oldest brother, heard it, he delivered him out of their hands, saying, Let us not take his life. Reuben said to them, Shed no blood. Throw him into this pit here in the wilderness, but lay no hand on him. He said that so that he could rescue him out of their hand and restore him to his father. So when Joseph came with it to his brothers, they stripped him of his robe, 
the long robe of sleeves that he wore, and they took him and threw him into a pit. The pit was empty, and there was no water in it. And then the brothers sat down to eat, and looking up, they saw a caravan of Ishmaelites coming from Gilead with their camels carrying gum, balm, and resin on their way, carrying it down to Egypt. Then Judah said to his brothers, What profit is it if we kill our brother and conceal his blood? Come, let us sell him to the Ishmaelites and not lay our hands on him, for he is our brother, our own flesh. And his brothers agreed. When some Midianite uh, traders passed by, they drew Joseph up, lifting him out of the pit, and sold him to the Ishmaelites for 20 pieces of silver. And they took Joseph to Egypt. The epistle reading is from Romans. Jim is doing a series on Romans, and we're continuing on with that. We're reading Romans chapter 10, verses 5 through 15. Verse 5. Moses writes concerning the righteousness that comes from the law, that the person who does these things will live by them. But the righteousness that comes from faith says, Do not say in your heart who will ascend into heaven, that is, to bring Christ down, or who will descend into the abyss, that is, to bring Christ up from the dead. But what does it say? The word is near you, on your lips and in your heart. That is the word of faith that we proclaim. Because if you confess with your lips that Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. For one believes with the heart and so is justified, and one confesses with the mouth and so is saved. The scripture says no one who believes in him will be put to shame. For there is no distinction between Jew and Greek. The same Lord is Lord of all and is generous to all who call on him. For everyone who calls in the name of the Lord shall be saved. But how are they to call on one whom they have not believed? And how are they to believe in one of whom they have never heard? And how are they to hear without someone to proclaim him? And how are they to proclaim him unless they are sent? As it is written, how beautiful are the feet of those who bring good news. The gospel reading today is found in the Gospel of Matthew. Please stand together for the reading of this passage. Matthew chapter 14, verse 22 to 33. Jim has already alluded to this in his the kids' talk, so let's just read this amazing story. Verse 22. Immediately, Jesus made the disciples get into the boat and go on ahead to the other side while he dismissed the crowds. And after he had dismissed the crowds, he went up to the, when he went up the mountain by himself to pray. When evening came, he was there alone. But by this time, the boat, battered by the waves, was far from the land, for the wind was against them. And early in the morning, he came walking toward them on the sea. But when the disciples saw him walking on the sea, they were terrified, saying, It's a ghost. And they cried out in fear. But he immediately, Jesus spoke to them and said, Take heart, it's I. Do not be afraid. Peter answered him, Lord, if it's you, command me to come to you on the water. Jesus said, Come. So Peter got out of the boat, started walking on the water, and came toward Jesus. But when he noticed the strong wind, he became frightened and began to sink. And beginning to sink, he cried out, Lord, save me. Jesus immediately reached out his hand and caught him, saying to him, You of little faith, why did you doubt? When they got into the boat, the wind ceased. And those in the boat worshipped Jesus, saying, Truly, you are the Son of God. This is the word of Jesus Christ. Please be seated.
Continuing in our focus this summer in the lectionary readings from the Paul's book, the Rome to the Romans, his letter to the Romans, I invite you to think today with me in this text from Romans 10. Because if you confess with your lips that Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. For one believes with the heart and so is justified, and one confesses with the mouth and so is saved. Please join me in your hearts in prayer. Come, Holy Spirit, come. Come like a wind and cleanse. Come like a fire and burn. Convict, convert, and consecrate our lives to our great good and to your great glory. We pray in our Savior's name. Amen. Are Canadians racist? Well, last spring and this early summer, and even as it continues now, the news was filled with stories regarding anti-racism protests and the topic of racism dominated media at all levels. We don't like to think of Canada as a country that, where racism reigns. We don't like to think of ourselves as racist. Peter Stockland is a senior writer with Cardus, and it's an independent Christian think tank that in, endeavors to, or is, for, the, for the purpose um, to engage in the desire to translate the richness of, Canadian, of Christian faith tradition into the public square. In an article, Facing the Root of Racism, Stockland wrote, Canada is full of racism for the same reason that houses of worship are filled with sinners. As so I read Stockland's article against the backdrop of other media discussion of racism, it became obvious that people approach the issue from quite different understandings of human life. Stockland's assumption is that people stand before God naked. I don't mean without clothes. I mean exposed, nothing hidden the movements of each human's heart completely known. I mean, we may be able to hide our prejudices from others through politeness, but not so with God. I mean, those negative attitudes that, uh, towards others because of their race that bubble up in our hearts, attitudes that are imbibed from lots of places and experiences, require constant vigilance to quell. As Christians navigate, though, the landscape of cultural issues like racism, our starting point shapes everything about our response. It's the same for people who do not share our starting point. Their starting points shape theirs as well. As we converge in conversations in the public square on a topic, any topic, the divergence of these starting points becomes evident. It's one of the reasons why sometimes it feels like we're talking past one another. To the Christian, Jesus Christ is the starting and ending point. The love of God for every be human being is the same, even seen in the self-forgetful, self-giving of the Son on the cross for our sin. The gospel, the good news that is Jesus Christ, shapes our understanding for everything about life. Our neighbor, any neighbor, is a person for whom Jesus died, and loves beyond our imagination, just as we understand Jesus' love of us. And so our treatment of our neighbor, any neighbor, for the Christian is guided by this love of our Lord. It follows that racist attitudes of all kinds need to be repudiated. A point I raise with you, though, is that in these societal conversations, we discover that there is no shared beginning point. The idea, for example, that humans have intrinsic value because they bear the image of God, once commonly shared in our society, can no longer be assumed in any discussion. I wonder if the church became complacent during those days of shared values and let up on the importance of teaching gospel perspectives. It behooves us as Christians to recognize that things have changed and in this era, where different narratives lead to quite different trajectories for living life, Christians need to know the gospel. We need to be schooled in its logic. 
This is one of the reasons I've chosen to preach through Romans this summer, Paul's great tome on the gospel. And so I invite you to reflect with me as we probe on what it means to confess with your lips that Jesus is Lord and believe in your hearts that God raised him from the dead. Now, when speaking of confessing and believing in this way, the Apostle Paul is describing the believer's experience of saving faith. Faith, biblically speaking, is relationship with God. Confessing and believing is to engage the salvation God won for us in Christ's life given for us. It's our part as we share in it. Paul isn't offering a formula to, for acquiring an admit one ticket past the proverbial pearly gates. He's offering people Christ. He's describing the nature of that relationship with Christ. To know Jesus is to know life eternal. Confessing and believing, according to the gospel, is about being saved. It's about engaging in this salvation given us. Claire Carlyle is in her biography on the philosopher Soren Kierkegaard recounts the story of Kierkegaard preaching one of his sermons. It is September 1st, 1848, and he is preaching at Friday communion in the Church of Our Lady in Copenhagen. As he stands before Thorvaldsen's massive statue of Christ that's in that church, he takes as his subject for, for his discourse a verse, verse from John's Gospel where Jesus said, and I, if I am lifted up from the earth, will draw all people to myself. He explains to the small congregation that following Christ will lift them above worldly concerns. If a man's life is not to be frittered away, said Kierkegaard, being empty, emptily employed with what, while it lasts, is vanity, and when it is past, is nothingness, or busily employed with what makes a noise in the moment but has no echo in eternity, then there must be something higher that draws it. Now, outside the church on that day, the streets and the newspapers were noisy with electioneering. On October 5th of that year, all men, even peasants, will vote for members of the assembly which will draw up Denmark's new constitution. But Kierkegaard's sole concern is the spiritual life. The louder the public clamor about these things, the more decisively he sets himself against them. All that matters religiously, he insists, is this inwardness of each human being, not seeking to be a power in the external world. Now, whatever the noise of our world, that consumes the streets and media. Jesus Christ stands among us, insisting that we need saving. Kierkegaard is a brilliant philosopher, and yet he insists that there's something, someone higher has to draw us up if our lives are to be more than what makes noise in the moment but has no echo in eternity. If in the Roman world of Paul's day, Philosophers abounded espousing pathways and programs for a meaningful life. Paul a, had a brilliant mind and could have achieved much in the possibilities of the world that was before him that would have afforded him for a rich life. Yet, here he is insisting that salvation in Jesus Christ is what we humans need. Now, when I say that I have little confidence in the human spirit, I am not meaning to say that there's something wrong with being human. God came among us in the man Jesus of Nazareth. Being human is a fit vehicle for the living God. The problem is that we humans are sinners. Yes, it's true, I have personally been the beneficiary of what we call the milk of human kindness from many places. There is much goodwill in our world today that occurs daily among people, people of varying religious commitment. And as happy as all that is, the point the gospel makes is that this won't save us. Paul has just written of his fellow Jews. He said, I can testify that they have a zeal for God, but it is not enlightened. For being ignorant of the righteousness that comes from God and seeking to establish their own, they have not submitted to God's righteousness. God insists that we need saving. And being zealous for God, or being zealous for doing good, like 
ending racism, won't save us if that zealousness is an attempt to establish our own righteousness rather than receiving the righteousness that is from God. Confessing with your lips that Jesus is Lord. In the wake of Jesus' encounter with the Pharisee Paul on his journey to Damascus, the now Christian apostle Paul came to understand that Jesus of Nazareth, who had been exalted by God, was both Israel's Messiah and the world's true Lord, or humanity's Lord. And this leads Paul to a radical reorientation of his life. Paul comes to understand that God's redemptive plan has ever been looking forward to bringing it to its climax in the person, ministry, and saving work of Jesus of Nazareth. And because Jesus is humanity's Lord, the word from the prophet Joel takes on new meaning for Paul. Everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. Therefore, no distinction is to be made by ethnicity. The same Lord is Lord of all and is generous to all who call on him. You see, this confession, Jesus is Lord, stands for much more than saying those three words. Jesus is Lord is considered to be a title or a summary phrase that stood for an early church creed confessed at baptism. Paul speaks of this confession in his first letter to the Corinthians where he says no one can say Jesus is Lord except by the Holy Spirit. When the gospel speaks of confessing our sin, for example, confessing means that we agree with God that we're sinners. And so to confess Jesus is Lord is to orient our life to the reality of his lordship of everything. Confessing with our lips means more than merely saying things, though it surely includes our speech. Confessing with our lips is an expression that includes the conduct of our life, or it's a metaphor for the conduct of our life. It's akin to the image, the, uh, the Hebrew image of walking as a metaphor for the believer's pattern of life shaped by commitment to God through obedience to God. Jesus insisted that our word and practice line up and that we practice what we preach. So to confess Jesus as Lord is also subversive in a world filled with many lords. Christians in the Roman Empire found themselves in that really awkward place because the emperor required an annual ritual commitment to the emperor's lordship. Christians confessing that Jesus is Lord and understood that there's only, there is one and no other. And so they refused to participate in the emperor's ritual and consequently were accused of sedition. The theologian Karl Barth was removed from his teaching position at gunpoint at, at the University of Bonn in Germany for his opposition to Hitler, having insisted that Jesus Christ is the one word of God whom we have to trust and obey. In our culture, Christian voices are marginalized and silenced in government, in education, now in corporation. But there are other things that press to be lords of our lives. Wealth, prestige, power, these and their cousins, lust for domination. And even good things like family and career push to be first. You see, confessing Jesus as Lord is to permeate the Christian's life at every level. The gospel asserts that Jesus has been given the place of authority over everything in heaven and on earth. In Paul's Ephesian letter, he says that Christ is at the right hand of the Father, far above all rule and authority and power and dominion, and that God put all things under his feet and made him head over all things. And so to confess Jesus is Lord is to confess reality, to reorient life in accord with this true nature of our existence. To confess Jesus as Lord also is to know ourselves loved beyond measure. There are lots of deists in our world that confess a vague notion of some being who created. For example, Aristotle, who had advanced the idea of the prime mover. Everything in light, the universe, he said, had a cause, and so he postulated that there had to be an uncaused first cause. Something had to get it going, in other words. The point being, does this prime mover or does this creator that people imagine love us? You see, we discover in Jesus Christ that God loves us, beyond our imagining, and that his steadfast love endures forever, we learn that this one who loves us in Jesus Christ is also our creator. It's always in that order. 
First, we come and know Jesus. Then we understand he's our creator. That's why we say God loves us, the one who made us. Believing in your heart that God raised Jesus from the dead. You see, there's more here than giving some sort of mental assent to the facticity of the resurrection of Jesus Christ. But it, in, it includes that, to be sure. Like the confession, Jesus is Lord, standing for so much more, so believing in your heart that God raised him from the dead does as well. In the apostolic proclamation of the resurrection of Jesus, that is the vindication that Jesus' life and death has achieved all that he set out to do for our salvation. This phrase, God raised him from the dead, is a kind of shorthand for all of that, that vindication. Jesus, what he did successfully brings our salvation. And to believe this is to embrace our Lord's saving work as our own. Now, what does it mean to believe in your heart? Well, faith in Scripture is a kind of knowing. It's the kind of knowing that, like the one, the knowing of knowing that person who is dearest to you in life loves you. It's that kind of knowing. This is what it means to believe in your heart. It's, it's there that you know it. The heart, thinking biblically, is the seat of your affections and understanding and will. Note we're commanded to love God with all that we are. And so it's our, in our hearts that we know ourselves loved by Jesus. Believing in your heart includes organizing the loves of our lives so that love for him comes first. Believing in our hearts touches on what is dear to us, on who is dear to us, on who enthuses us. John Bunyan, the best-known Puritan author, he wrote Pilgrim's Progress. If you haven't read it, I commend it to you. He came to faith in Jesus Christ when he accidentally overheard four impoverished women talking naturally among themselves while they were taking a break from home-making tasks. He overheard them speak of what it meant to them to be bathed in God's love for them, what it meant to know Jesus. They sounded to me as though they had found a new world, Bunyan wrote later. Well, indeed, the four women had. He came upon them when they were talking as unselfconsciously as we might talk about, well, about what matters to us. We read today of Jesus walking on water and Peter's sinking experience. Jesus called his disciples little faiths in this text. And so sometimes as we read that story, we think if the disciples had trouble with the story and they were there, what shot do we have? Well, rather than take this as chastisement about weak faith and the vacillations in believing, take hold of the encouragement that's in this text. Note that Jesus reached out and rescues a sinking Peter. It isn't our, the strength of our faith that saves us, but the power of the one who saves. If you confess with your lips that Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved, exudes the Apostle Paul. Why is this salvation? The answer, Jesus Christ. Amen. As we respond to what God has said to us in and through the word today, we're going to share in this hymn, Crown Him with Many Crowns, is a video we're going to watch and follow along, and uh, let's take joy in this hymn.
invite you to join together in confessing our faith, and uh, we will do so with the Apostles' Creed. Let's confess our faith together. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, God's only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended to the dead. On the third day, he rose again. He ascended into heaven. He is seated at the right hand of the Father, and he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. In the name of our Savior, Jesus Christ, who said, whoever comes to me will never be hungry, whoever believes in me will never be thirsty, and no one who comes to me will I ever drive away. While we are not able to invite you physically to the table today, we come to share in the liturgy, looking forward in when we will be able to participate in it. And we, today we remember, each time as we gather, and we share in it, that we proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. And so we do so today, proclaiming his death until he comes. As we join together in our uh, prayer of great thanksgiving, you will see the places that we will speak together, and those in response will be on the screen. We are going to say the um, Sanctus today and also the Mystery of one to two, as we come to that point in the prayer where we'll pause for our silent prayer that we might remember one another in our prayers and those things that are on our hearts, um, to remember today the family of Vic Fitzsakerly. Uh, Vic passed away on July 31st, and uh, just remember his family uh, in your prayers. And so let's join together now in the prayer of great thanksgiving. The Lord be with you. Lift up your hearts. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is indeed right that we should praise you, gracious God, for you created all things. You formed us in your own image, male and female, you created us. When we turned away from you in sin, you did not cease to care for us, but opened a path of salvation for all people. You made a covenant with Israel, and through your servants Abraham and Sarah gave the promise of a blessing to all nations. Through Moses you led your people from bondage into freedom. Through the prophets you renewed your promise of salvation. Therefore with them, and with all your saints who have served you in every age, we give you thanks and proclaim the glory of your name, saying together, Holy, holy, holy Lord, God of power and might, heaven and earth are full of your glory. Hosanna in the highest. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest. Holy God, source of life and goodness, all creation rightly gives you praise. In the fullness of time, you sent your Son, Jesus Christ, to share our human nature, to live and die as one of us, to reconcile us to you, the God and Father of us all. He healed the sick, ate and drank with outcasts and sinners. He opened the eyes of the blind and proclaimed the good news of your kingdom to the poor and to those in need. In all things, he fulfilled your gracious promise. And so in confidence, we offer our needs to you in him. In this moment of silent prayer, let's remember those that we are bringing to the Lord today.
Gracious God, by the death of your Son, you have destroyed the power of death, and by raising him to life, you have given us life forevermore. Therefore, we proclaim the mystery of faith. Christ has died, Christ is risen, Christ will come again. On the night he was betrayed, our Lord Jesus Christ took bread, and after giving thanks to you, he broke it, and he gave it to his disciples and said, Take, eat. This is my body which is given for you. Do this for the remembrance of me. After the supper, he took the cup of wine, and after giving thanks, he gave it to them and said, Drink this, all of you. This is my blood of the new covenant which is shed for you and for many for the forgiveness of sins. Whenever you drink it, do this for the remembrance of me. Recalling his death, proclaiming his resurrection, and looking for his coming again in glory, we offer you, O God, this bread and this cup, that all who eat and drink at your table may be one body, one holy people, a living sacrifice in Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Now, while we are not sharing physically in the meal today, anticipating that we will be able to do this as the fall unfolds, but at the moment we will continue in our current discipline. And so I invite you to join me now in the prayer that follows the communion. For as often as you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death till he comes. Lord Jesus, we thank you for your promise to be present with us in the act of communion. While we cannot now receive the elements of bread and wine, yet your love transcends this moment in time. Strengthen our faith that we may grow in love for you and for each other. Through Jesus Christ, the risen Lord. Amen. And now may the risen Christ go with you behind you to support you, beside you to befriend you, above you to watch over you, under you to hold you up, within you to empower you, and in front of you to show you the way. And the blessing of God Almighty, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, uphold you evermore. Take your 